It's time to get the breakdown started. First up, 10 observations. It's first and 10. The fit of Eric Bieniemy and Sam Howell wasn't designed to win football games, and the guise of growth and development was all very nonsensical. In hindsight, in my opinion, let's unpack that very loaded statement. I do not have the fancy numbers right now. Anthony, if you want to help me out with the fancy numbers, I don't know if you have access to them, but this computer over here is being being a butthead. Uh, but th- this is where we're going to start and where we'll spend most of our time to get started. Um, here's the thing. I think Sam Howell can be a, a solid NFL quarterback. I think Eric Bieniemy is a good offensive coordinator, but... I do not think either is elite, and I think for non-elite coaches and coordinators uh, and quarterbacks especially, but really all players, fit is essential. If Sam Howell was inserted to the Detroit Lions starting lineup and got to hand the ball off as often as Jared Goff does, or if he was asked to do what Brock Purdy is doing in San Francisco, um what Gardner Minshew was asked to do in, in Indianapolis. I'm trying to pick a variety of places so it doesn't feel like I'm just loving up on the same coaches and staffs that are the best in the NFL in Detroit and San Francisco this year to 10 win teams. Um, or, uh, you know, Kyle Shanahan. Ah, oh, he's the people are sick of hearing about Kyle Shanahan, right? And it's not like Brock Purdy wouldn't be better. Uh, it's not like Sam Howell would be better than Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy's playing that system as well as you can. Um, He's elevating it, but he's not asked to do the kinds of things that Sam Howell is asked to do here. And the reason that we have been given all season long is that it's in Sam's best interest for development. And also they're trying to win football games. And it's just a stupid plan. I have no nicer way to say it. Um, I could, I probably could come up with something that's more elegant and more less direct, but it's just a stupid freaking plan. And I'm tired of being like treated uh, by the people who are supposed to be smarter. Like I'm the one who's wrong here. They're four and 10 and the quarterback is going backwards and he looks shell shocked. And it looks like he's regressed. I actually don't know that the performance was as bad as it felt coming out of yesterday because there were a couple of key drops and some things that I, upon second watch, you're like, was it that bad? But it wasn't good. He, and at the end of the day, the results are the results. They're 4-10. and 10. He threw for 102 yards. Jacoby Brissett came in and threw for more yards and less than half the passes and got the leading receiver involved and the first-round pick from last year. Two guys who are having awful seasons based off the comparison of what we thought they could be. McLaurin, a near 1,500-yard receiver if things went the way we thought they could. Dotson, a guy who would be pushing 1,000 and maybe 80 receptions on the year. He's been a ghost. And the idea that this is somehow okay because in the long run, it's worth it, or that this was a feasible plan to win football games is nuts. And, you know, that's going to come back on, well, you thought they were going to be good. Yeah, I did because I didn't think they'd be stupid enough to do this. I just, I can't believe that we are here. I cannot believe that people that are paid millions of dollars to coach NFL football took a quarterback in Sam Howell, who is super talented from an arm strength standpoint, seems to have his head on straight, is willing to work his tail off, but has flaws, has things that need to be massaged out because he's a young player. And that's what happens at that position. And they were like, We're going to have you throw the ball more than anyone else in the league. And we're going to run the same stuff every weekend so defenses sit on it. And it just gets harder and harder every single week. And it's going to hang our defense out to dry, although they haven't helped themselves. And it it just is nonsense. And the idea was that, oh, well, he's going to see a lot of different stuff because he's going to throw so many times. Do we think this is good for Sam Howell? Who thinks that Sam Howell's on the right track right now? Nobody. Nobody. This isn't the way to do it. And I've been screaming about this since like week three. And I just, I feel both validated and angered by it. And to be honest, like, I don't know. I I wasn't this angry before the show. I didn't think this would turn into like a full-on rant. But here we are. Just, I'm 
maybe this has been inside me since watching yesterday and just seeing Brissett do it, you're like, yeah, because that dude knows what it's like to play at NFL speeds. That dude knows what it's like to deal with a crap offensive line or at least one that's that's at the very least league average. By the time it got to Brissett yesterday, like he knew, oh God, Gates is back in there at center. Uh, Charles Leno's out, although Cornelius Lucas is almost as good, if, and if not on some days, better than Leno anyway. So like, you've, you've got to get the ball out of your hands, and there's an urgency and, a, and an understanding of the timing and the footwork and all this stuff that Brissett has. And even before he came in, I didn't think that was going to happen, but it was the right move because um, I don't think at that point you're helping Sam by leaving him in. I actually, for the first time, really wondered what the season would have looked like with Jacoby Brissett. They'd probably have a couple more wins. Um, but there's also some games that Sam was awesome. And this is this is the hard part of trying to weigh all of this. But the idea, and th- this is the larger thing 1.1 1. 1 of first and 10. The idea that this was a good idea to either win football games or develop Sam is absolute nonsense. Absolutely, utterly ridiculous. The best way to develop Sam would be what Detroit has done with Jared Goff and what L.A. did with Jared Goff to limit his impact on the game as much as you possibly can so that he learns to understand things and he sees things in smaller doses and can learn week to week and grow out of things. And, and to insulate him from a roster standpoint with a better offensive line and some of the things that he needs to succeed at this point in a very young, but albeit promising, career. You can't just throw a guy to the wolves. There's a reason that when you, you uh, teach a kid how to ride a bike, you don't just throw him out there on a 12-speed. You're like, no, nah, man, we're going to give you training wheels, and then I'm going to hold you, and then eventually you learn how to do it. Like If you learn to box, you're not going to get in the ring with 1992 Mike Tyson and just go at it. It's not how you get learn how to box. It's how you get your ass kicked. And that's basically what they did to Sam Howell. It's like, hey, man, it's the NFL. Go out there and do it. There are ways to have training wheels on in the NFL. There are ways to hold guys so the bike doesn't tip over in the NFL. And they did none of it this year. None of it. And this is the result. And it just feels like such a wasteful season, such a wasteful way to operate because it just, it so obviously doesn't have to be this way. And all you have to do is look around. (sighs) Apparently I need to get that off my chest. Uh, Anthony, if we have it, number two, please. Number two. When it comes to Sam himself, the footwork and timing is still incredibly inconsistent. I mean, there are times he, like, takes the snap and there's, like, a pause. And then he rushes the drop back. And you're like, that's not how you do the timing. You don't make one too slow and then one too fast. There needs to be an easiness. Because the way a West Coast offense is designed is your feet match the pattern. And sometimes on a three, like, there's a drop. And it could be a three-step and the ball's out now. It could be a five-step and the ball's out to your second guy. Or it could be a five-step and a hitch or five-step and two hitches and the ball is out to to later down the progression or your check down and or your check down. And that timing is all off with Howell. And it's why it doesn't feel like he's made a play on schedule in forever. He actually made a few more yesterday and I realized, again, that second watch felt very different than the first watch because it's less emotional. You're less riding the wave of the game and more of just like, okay, what happened here? But it wasn't good by any stretch. And there's just a lot of... A lot of stuff that you're just like, I think this should be better by now. But it's hard, too, because, one, I don't think he trusts the line in front of him. And he's never going to say that. And he might not, like, feel that emotionally. But, like, subconsciously, there's a lack of trust there. And I also don't think he sees the field particularly well, which could be a height thing. It could be an NFL adjustment. He's still young, less than a season's worth of start thing. Um and then I don't think he trusts his receivers either. And why would he? There was another bunch of drops yesterday. Or, you know, he swings a ball out wide to Antonio Gibson. And Gibson bobbles it. And what should be a 7-8 yard gain becomes a 2 yard gain. Because he doesn't catch it clean. And there's things like that all over the field. I mean, he drills John Bates in the chest with what would have been a nice chain mover. Um, I mean, they got screwed on the McLaren PI down the field. Like, there's, there's all kinds of yardage that's just left on the field that's not on Howell yesterday. 
And that probably cycles and, and makes it feel worse for him that leads to a bunch of yardage that's left off the field. That is on him. And whether it's missing guys, Nikki Javala had a, uh, on, the, on the fourth down conversion, Nikki uh, did a good job of watching the tape and seeing that even though it was a beautiful, like crazy improv play by Sam to, to Terry, if in timing, he just hits Jonathan Williams on the wheel route, he walks in with a Cooper Cup-esque amount of space. Stuff like that seemingly every week at this point. It's just the feel, the vision, the timing, the rhythm, none of it's there. And it's, uh, it's not good. Number three, uh, yesterday, yet another example of just the lack of cohesiveness in a roster built by Ron Rivera, especially on the offensive side of the ball. They bring in Scott Turner with Ron back in 2020, and they're like, we have this big arm quarterback. This McLaren kid seems pretty good. Like, we're going to be a big down the field passing team. And then obviously they, they transition from Dwayne Haskins through whatever else they went through that year, eventually to Alex Smith. And then they're like, we got to run the football more. And then there was like this epic war for two years between uh, seemingly Rivera and Turner about running the football that eventually Ron won. And they come out of last year and they're like, we have got to run the football more. And then what did they do? They hired Eric Bieniemy, the most pass happy offensive coordinator in the league. And they kept building the roster all the while like they wanted to run the football. I mean, think back to last year, Trey Turner and Andrew Norwell. Those guys, not mobile. Not good pass protectors, big honking, run blocking, 330 pound guards, and that's what they did in Carolina. And this is not Carolina. The personnel doesn't match. And they draft Brian Robinson because they want to be a smash mouth football team. And they keep passing the ball. And so they keep every offseason seemingly want to run the run the ball and they get their personnel that matches that. Like Andrew Wiley as a run blocker this year has graded out very well. Andrew Wiley as a pass protector obviously leaves something to be desired. Same thing with the left side of the offensive line. Charles Leno's run block win rate is very, very high. His pass block win rate actually is not that bad, but he's had a bunch of high profile mistakes that have cost them sacks and, and whatever else. So you can't build a team one way and then operate it the other and expect it to work. And that's exactly what they've done offensively. And it is not surprising considering how bad Rivera has been in general with the roster building um, defensively too, right? You know, the William Jackson example being the prime one. Uh, as for the last thing on the offense. Number four. Uh, the drops, I mentioned this already. The drops were worse than I remembered. Um, and it definitely would have helped because there were some times earlier in the game where Sam was back there and like more in rhythm, some confidence, his body language looked good. And he's ripping throws and they just, and they didn't get the conversions that they should have. The Bates drop and maybe that ball was tipped in fairness to John, but like that's a big one over the middle that he makes a great throw on and it is dropped. Uh, and late in the second quarter, Curtis Samuel has a drop. Antonio Gibson had that that ball that I mentioned that he bobbled that should have been like a bigger gain, but he bobbles it. It's it's not the best throw, but it's an easily catchable ball that if he just catches it cleanly and turns up field, you get a nice little gain. Instead, he bobbles and barely catches it before rolling out of bounds for a gain of two. Not included on that is the interception. Um, that is a brutal throw from how just twid you're on to do way too much across his body. He's got two guys in front of him, too, that are easy completions at any point that he's rolling out. Um, and instead, he throws the ball back across his body to Terry. And while, yes, Terry tips it up and makes it a fairly easy pick, if Terry doesn't get a hand on it, there's a defender right behind him that it hits him in the chest. And by the way, I, you know, I started to text Logan a little bit earlier, and I was like, am I crazy or did Sam have a better day than, than we remember? And then I kept watching and, and started to think a little bit more. I mean, he got so lucky on that ball that he throws up the sideline to Terry that that's not pick. That was a gift that one defender broke up from another. Both, either one of them could have very easily had a pick. There's plenty of other stuff. It's, uh, Sam, Sam was not good yesterday. But his PFF grade came in at like a 50-something, which is higher than I was expecting. And so relative to what I felt coming out of the game where I thought he might have graded out as like a 30, um, I guess it's better, but it wasn't it wasn't good. That is for sure. Number five. The Cameron Cheeseman stuff. I just wrote Cheeseman in the rundown. Um, if you don't know, Cameron Cheeseman, the long snapper, has, has been cut today. Uh, they've got a short list of replacements that they should have gone to. In August, 
I did. I spent more time on Cheeseman than anyone else. At least I hope I did. If someone spent more time on him than me than the preseason, then God, God bless them. But I was just like, you don't have to do this. And yet, Ron Rivera, because they traded up for him and they drafted him and whatever, and they liked his velocity on his snaps, which is elite. They were like, ah, he'll work it out. He'll work it out. No, he wasn't. He didn't work it out. He's he's not good, not NFL caliber, not professional. And you know what I feel bad for? I feel bad for Cameron Cheeseman in a way because he's going to get a bunch of vitriol that if Ron had just does his, done his job, Cameron Cheeseman can move on with his life. And Cheeseman is has been stand-up. He's apparently a great dude, um, been professional, always stepped up and been like, hey, I'm accountable. Ask me whatever questions you want. I'll answer them. And the problem is he kept having to do it, and the coach didn't cut him to the point that after the game yesterday where he knew he was done, he's like, honestly, most places I wouldn't have, I wouldn't still be here. When he knows it, why, why is Ron the last guy to... Maybe he doesn't not the last guy to know, but he's certainly the last guy to do anything about it. And that's just ridiculous for a long snapper. Again, all due respect to the position, all due respect to Cameron Cheeseman, but there's enough dudes out there that you didn't have to do this, and it damn near got Tressway hurt. Speaking of number six. There should have been a roughing penalty on that play. The the snap is terrible. Tress pounces on it, and he's laying there on the ground, and the Rams dude just jumps on top of him and smashes him in the head. That was ridiculous to not get a penalty flag called. Um, and But the defense did a good job of holding after, so that's that's nice. Number seven. Um, the, the, the cap, the cherry on top of the Cameron Cheeseman debacle yesterday, and sl- which is really the Ron Rivera debacle, is the end of that game and just how terribly Ron and Eric bien and to an extent Jacoby Brissett managed that. Um, To get down to the one-yard line with almost five minutes to go, I think it was 440 on the clock, and not score until underneath the two-minute warning because you your play calling is a nightmare. Your your clock management is worse. Your execution is not good enough. It's just a joke it's I mean that's hard to do to spend that much time at the one inch line and the fact when you know they call the the QB sneak for from reset from like the one yard line he doesn't get in they're now two inches away one of those were like when the center resets the ball to snap it after it was laying flat on the ground the tip of the ball is like over the goal line they're that close Brissett is that big just run it again Instead, they go to shotgun at that point. What are we doing? And all the while, you're huddling. You're making substitutions. You are you have no urgency. You're snapping the ball with five seconds or less on the play clock. What a joke that was. Concluding with... Number eight. Then you don't go for two? The easiest analytics-supported decision that exists. Go for two when you're down 14. We just saw this work for Tennessee to win a game. And you do it on a day where your long snapper is shown with the yips and he has another low snap. You, you, you get the extra point blocked. What a disaster. That was also just perfectly poetic. Ugh. Last two things. Number nine. The defense actually did more than enough to win yesterday, especially with how they played in the first half. The offense gave them squad douche in terms of support and, in fact, gave them a couple of short fields. They forced turnovers. They, yes, Stafford started, what was it, like 10 for 10, 12 for 12. I remember hearing 9 for 9 at the very least in the broadcast at one point. Stafford was fantastic yesterday and accurate, and he makes quick decisions and gets the ball out, and that makes it easy to get completions. But they bent but didn't break, which is how this thing is designed. They weren't going to be good. It's this defense. They've been historically bad. But they were better, and I think Rivera, while he deserves blame for all this other stuff, deserves whatever credit you get for simplifying things. Uh, It'd be nice if BSJ and Cam Curl could figure out who was supposed to carry that wheel route up the sideline. But, hey, one coverage bust is better than four. Um, And, you know, they got some sacks yesterday. Like, they they played better, and had they had any support from the offense, they would have played well enough to win. Unfortunately, they didn't get that. But the one giant defensive mystery to wrap this thing up is... Number 10. Where the hell was Emmanuel Forbes yesterday? He played six snaps. 
this whole final quarter of the season is about developing and evaluating young guys, and the guy you took in the first round is on the bench for all but six snaps? Like, I know Kendall Fuller and BSJ are your starters, but ro- like if you could rotate Sadiq Charles and Chris Paul, you could rotate one of your corners in so that your first-round pick gets more than six snaps. The only reason this is the last thing on the list is because he, I know he's coming off an injury. Maybe he wasn't quite ready. Maybe something in one of those earlier snaps uh, bothered him and he came out. Rivera didn't say anything today along those lines. But damn, man, that's that's inexplicable with where they are in the season. Which, by the way, is inexplicable to be where they are in the season. This is the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.